The Flint Water Crisis, Part 1, Origins. It started with high water bills. Flint, Michigan had some of the most expensive water in the country, so to save money, the city's emergency manager decided to switch to a different water source. But Flint residents were worried about the switch, since their new water source would be the Flint River, and the Flint River was once so polluted that there were stories about it bursting into flames. Actually, there were two separate stories about it bursting into flames. It was apparently a very flammable river. Needless to say, no one wanted to drink from the Flint River, but it didn't matter. The city made the switch anyway. Almost immediately, many residents realized that they were right to have been worried. In some areas of the city, the water tasted fine. In others, it stank. And while the water ran clear in many homes, in some, the water didn't look right. In fact, when the fire hydrants were opened on a particular street, the water inside was dark brown. But the city claimed, over and over again, that the water was safe, even as Flint citizens were being poisoned by lead and dying from Legionnaire's pneumonia. How could an American city poison its own water supply? To understand Flint's water crisis, you have to go back to the last century. During the early 1900s, General Motors set up shop in the city, and for generations people made a living in the car plants. But after the 1960s, General Motors slowly peeled away from Flint until almost nothing was left. This had nothing to do with Flint and everything to do with globalization. GM could make its cars for cheaper elsewhere, so it moved. This is why the average high school educated worker is now employed by retail stores like Walmart or Target, not by the local steel mill. But we'll get more into globalization in another article. For now, back to poisoning small children. As the jobs left, those residents of Flint who could moved away from Flint and on to other jobs. But black people were only allowed to hold the worst paying jobs at General Motors. On top of that, they were only allowed to live in a few small areas of town where the rents were higher. Yes, you read that right. Black workers always made less than white workers, and they were charged more for housing. Black Flint residents also weren't eligible for the cheap home loans that were available to white workers. To make a long story short, when white people wanted to leave Flint, they could generally sell their houses, take their money, and go. But when black people wanted to leave Flint, they were usually stuck. But most white people didn't leave Flint because of money. They left because they didn't want to live near black people. White people began pouring out of cities all over the country during the late 1960s and early 1970s, and it wasn't because of General Motors. What white people were really running away from were fair housing laws. By the late 1960s, black people and other people of color were finally legally allowed to own homes in white neighborhoods. Totally by coincidence, the white people in those neighborhoods immediately moved to the suburbs. As Flint shrank, it ran into economic trouble, mostly because Wisconsin's government was full of people who didn't understand basic math. It's pretty simple. As the number of people living in Flint went down, so did the amount of taxes the city could collect. Fewer people paying taxes equals less money. Duh. So Flint's budget was naturally shrinking, and on top of that, the state kept cutting the amount of money that it gave to Flint. The state justified this by pointing out that there were fewer people in Flint, so the city should need less money. There was at least one very big problem with that line of reasoning, the passage of time itself. Flint's infrastructure, meaning things like electricity lines, roads, and water pipes, was old. And old things need to be repaired and replaced. That was actually a huge reason why the water was so expensive. The pipes were oozing, badly enough that about 50% of the water was just being lost to leaks, which the people of Flint were then paying for. The answer to the high water bills in Flint was pretty simple. The pipes needed to be replaced. But the people of Flint didn't get to make decisions like that for themselves. That's because in 2011, the state of Wisconsin put an emergency manager in charge of Flint. This manager was supposed to bring down the city's $25.7 million debt. Flint's local government, the mayor, the city council, everyone who was actually voted in, was powerless. The person in control was the state-appointed, completely unelected emergency manager. One of these emergency managers, Darnell Early, decided that the best idea to bring down water costs and help Flint's budget was to switch to another water source, one that hadn't even been built yet. No problem. In the meantime, the city would just use the Flint River. The Flint Water Crisis, Part 2. Source. The city of Flint turned on the water from the Flint River on April 25, 2014. Within three months, they were getting complaints from citizens, complaints that the city hand-waved. And in a way, the city was right. The issue wasn't with the Flint River water itself. The river had been cleaned up over the last 50 years, and it was actually safe to drink. But while the water may have been safe, it wasn't high quality. It was corrosive, and as it flowed through the city's pipes, which were old, it stripped metals out of them. When witnesses saw brown water spray out of the fire hydrants on their streets, they were seeing iron that had leached into the water. And that's disgusting, but the real problem was something that often left no signs at all. 
lead. Human beings have always known that lead is dangerous. As far back as the ancient Greeks, working in mines that produced lead was known to kill you quickly and horribly. In fact, the Romans actually used mine work as a slow motion death sentence for exactly that reason. But while we've always understood that lead is a killer, it's become kind of a problematic fade. It's strong and can be used to join together all kinds of materials. Because lead is cheap and easy to use, American cities began putting it in water pipes. This generally wasn't a problem, except in cities like Flint, where the water was weirdly corrosive for whatever reason. But even corrosive water doesn't have to be a deal breaker for lead pipes. Water engineers came up with a way around it by adding a mix of chemicals called corrosion control that protects the pipes from the water. However, Flint water officials didn't add any corrosion control to the water when they switched to the Flint River as a water source. Meanwhile, families on Flint water started to notice all sorts of health problems. People developed rashes after showering or lost their hair, and some kids came down with illnesses that no one could explain. Moms and dads began insisting that the city come and test their water, but when inspectors came, they often found that the results were normal. Later, it came out that these inspectors were doing everything possible to make sure that they didn't get accurate readings. Many, many people continued to ask for water testing. Activists from Flint also did everything they could to force the city to switch back to its original water source, including going to court, but these efforts failed. Various organizations in the area even started doing bottled water drives so that Flint residents didn't have to drink their water. It's important to acknowledge these efforts because the people of Flint did not just sit back and wait to be rescued. They demanded action and answers. But of course, many of these Flint residents were black, which meant that they were often ignored or not taken seriously by people in power. The Flint Water Crisis, Part 3, Lies. No single event led directly to Flint being switched back to its original water source. However, the chain reaction that caused the switch began with a stupid, easily disproven lie about the water in the Walters family home. Like a lot of Flint residents, the whole Walters family started developing rashes and other skin complaints after the city began drawing water from the Flint River. Even worse, one of the younger Walters children started showing signs of developmental delays. And when the city inspector tested the family's water, he did find elevated lead levels. However, Mother Leanne Walters ran into problems when she tried to get answers by going to the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. The EPA was concerned by the lead levels in the Walters house, but the EPA is a national agency. Therefore, it needed to cooperate with a Michigan state agency to investigate the problem. So the EPA asked the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, MDEQ, for an explanation of the high lead levels in the Walters family water. The MDEQ told the EPA that the lead must have come from the home's pipes. Sad, but not the city's problem. Unfortunately for the MDEQ, this was an obvious lie. The home's plumbing had been completely replaced with plastic pipes just a few years before. It was literally impossible for the plumbing to be the source of the lead. Eventually, in April of 2015, the city of Flint actually shut off the water in the Walters home because the lead levels were so high. By that point, the youngest Walters child had already been diagnosed with lead poisoning. Over the course of early 2015, tons of tests were run on the Walters water by a lot of different agencies. Between between the results of those tests and the tests for other homes in the area, EPA official Miguel del Toro decided to write a report. The report, not surprisingly, suggested that the EPA take a closer look at the water in Flint. Del Toro also shared his report with Leanne Walters, who gave it to a journalist. The journalist did his job. He published del Toro's report. This put various state and local agencies on the defensive, with one official even saying to the media, Let me start here. Anyone who is concerned about lead in the drinking water in Flint can relax. But that official spoke too soon, because a few weeks after his statement, routine tests showed that Flint's water was chock full of lead. You'd think that city and state officials, faced with proof that the water in Flint was contaminated, would have immediately begun trying to fix the problem. But they didn't. Instead of getting their acts together, the MDEQ chose to cook the books. They went back over Flint's test results and threw out the worst too. This shrank Flint's average lead level to a point that it was bad, but not criminally bad. Meanwhile, although officials insisted that the water was totally safe, lead poisoning wasn't the city's only water problem. There were also over 90 cases of Legionnaire's disease in Flint's home county. Legionnaire's disease is a type of pneumonia that spreads through contaminated water, and it's lethal. By the end of the outbreak, 12 people were dead. Again, city and state officials screwed up. The county health department did notice the spread of the disease and did think that it might be related to Flint's new water source. However, other city and state departments always kicked the can down the road. When asked, 
each had a reason why it wasn't their job to figure out how the illness was spreading. And when a frustrated official with the county health department finally lost his patience and got in touch with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, the state of Michigan scolded him instead of helping him solve the problem. Great job, guys! The Flint Water Crisis, Part 4. Truth. In the summer of 2015, water engineer Ellen Batonzo met up with her childhood friend, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, for a cookout. Ellen, who used to work for the EPA and knew that they weren't investigating the Flint crisis nearly enough, talked to Dr. Mona about it. Dr. Mona, who was a pediatrician in Flint and had been telling her patients that the water was safe to drink, was horrified. But there was hope, although it was in an unlikely place. Ellen pointed out that the people behind a similar water crisis in Washington, D.C. had gotten away with it. Why? Because there wasn't a clear connection between D.C.'s contaminated water and the children who had been poisoned by it. Dr. Mona was the perfect person to have this conversation with because she worked at Hurley Medical Center, where most kids from Flint got their health care. Many of those kids were Medicaid patients, and the program required that they have their blood tested for lead when they were toddlers. Dr. Mona decided to look at those blood tests from the year before the water change and then the year afterward. If the records showed that the children's lead levels had risen, then Dr. Mona would have proof that the children of Flint were being poisoned by lead. Dr. Mona and her research coordinator, Jenny Lachance, put the numbers together. They focused on the youngest group of children, kids who were five and under, because lead poisoning is more damaging the younger you are. High levels of lead will eventually make an adult violent and crazy, but lead poisoning in children can stunt physical and intellectual growth. Dr. Mona's results were terrifying. The kids at her hospital, whose data she had access to, were being poisoned. Later, she was able to add information from other medical providers in the area that showed the same result. Kids were being hurt by the lead in the water. Later, she was able to add information from other medical providers in the area that showed the same result. Kids were being hurt by the lead in the water. After not being able to get state and local leaders to respond, Dr. Mona gave a press conference about her results. At first, the officials denied, denied, and denied some more. But no matter how much they denied it, the numbers spoke for themselves. In fact, the state of Michigan was eventually forced to release the blood data it had collected for Flint, and its data showed both that the children of Flint were being poisoned and that adults were dying from Legionnaire's disease. Whoops! The city of Flint switched back to its old water source on October 16, 2015. But the damage wasn't magically undone. Although the old water source is gentler on the pipes, and officials have added corrosion control, Flint's lead pipes still pose a danger to its residents. The only solution is to go in and replace all of the pipes, a process that will take a long time, although funding has been found for it. For the time being, the people of Flint are still forced to pay for, and drink, water that is likely to hurt them. Water that they will never trust again, and for good reason. This is a short series that I wrote in 2018 about the Flint water crisis, and have subsequently updated to make more accessible for teenagers. It's based on Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha's What the Eyes Don't See, a story of crisis, resistance, and hope in an American city, as well as Anna Clark's The Poison City, Flint's Water and the American Urban Tragedy. The information within the series is up to date, except in regards to deaths from Legionnaire's disease in Genesee County, where Flint is located. Recent reporting by Frontline has indicated that there were probably many more cases of the disease and deaths from it, but I chose not to update the articles with this information because the official death toll remains the same as it was in 2018. This episode was written, recorded, and edited by me, Claire Wong. Thanks, guys. See you next time.